Woi Manjika, and welcome from Nam, the traditional lands of the Kulin Nation. My name is Sharon Braun, and I'm an Associate Director of Programming with CEDA. I'm very pleased to introduce today's live stream discussing empowering First Nations peoples through authentic community engagement. Wherever you are today and wherever you work, live and play, we acknowledge the traditional custodians of the country we are meeting on. We recognise your continuing connection to the land and waters and acknowledge the stories, traditions and living cultures of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples on this land and commit to building a brighter future together. A connected future for Indigenous and non-Indigenous people starts with deep and authentic engagement and we look forward to hearing today from those who have worked closely with First Nations communities on their paths to success. Today's live stream will be followed by another next month on attracting and retaining Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander employees. A panel of industry leaders will discuss effective and employment programs, developing a value proposition for your business that is inclusive and examine some of the bumps these businesses have encountered on their journeys. Register now for the November 28 discussion at cedar.com.au. At CEDA, we continue to build on our purpose to improve the lives of Australians by enabling and a dynamic economy and vibrant society. Through independent research and frank debate, we influence policy and collaborate to disrupt for good. We invite you to explore other social and policy conversations at cedar.com.au. CEDA's website includes an array of resources, including research and policy papers, live stream recordings and opinion pieces, which pursue solutions that deliver better economic and social outcomes. Uh, we invite you to take advantage of the opportunities to actively participate in today's conversation. Uh, follow CEDA on Twitter at CEDA underscore news and add your comments and key takeaways using the hashtag Indigenous Engagement. Put your questions to the panel via our Pigeonhole app, which is available just below the live stream window on your screen, or log in on your devices by entering the URL cedar.pigeonhole.at and enter using the password authentic. We will endeavour to ask as many of your questions as time allows, but to help us understand those questions with the broadest interest, please review and vote on the questions entered in the app. Please also take a moment at the end of the live stream to rate your experience of today's discussion in Pigeonhole. I'm very pleased to welcome our panel participants for today's discussion, Chris Davies, Wilson Group National Indigenous Engagement Manager, and Kathy Henderson, Mary Beck City Council CEO. Thank you both for participating today. I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Unfortunately, our third panel member, Dennis Patty, has been unable to join us today due to illness. We are very sorry not to have Dennis join us and we wish him a speedy recovery. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our facilitator for today's discussion. Shelley Cable is a Wilman Noongar woman from Buraloo. I'm sorry, I probably butchered that. No, Shelley, uh, Perth. She is the leader of Mindaroo's Found Mindaroo Foundation's Generation One initiative, a role she took up at the age of 24 after two years with PwC Indigenous Consulting. Shelley is passionate about Indigenous business, economic empowerment, financial inclusion and ending economic disparity. And CEDA has been delighted to work with Shelley and her team in promoting their first Indigenous Employment Index. Shelley, thank you for joining us today. Over to you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sharon and Kaya, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be with you this morning. Um, I am dialing in from Buru, Perth. Well done, Sharon. On Wajak Noongar Wujja. Uh, and I would like to start by paying my respects to Noongar elders, who are also my elders, past and present. And while we're all meeting today online, all of us are simultaneously present and grounded on somebody's lands today. Whether you're dialing in from a city skyscraper you're, or you're at home, you're in a regional town or outbush, you are all present on country today. And I'd like to acknowledge the many lands that you, our audience, are dialing in from today and the traditional custodians and elders of those lands. And I thank them and acknowledge their continuing care for country, our country. It's my pleasure to be facilitating today's session. Once again, I'm Shelley Cable, Director of Generation One, and I too would like to extend a warm welcome to Chris and Kathy, who are joining us uh, as panellists today. And I would like to acknowledge Dennis Batty, who unfortunately can't join us. Uh, so we'll do our best to fill in his very big shoes. Today, we're here to talk about empowering First Nations peoples through authentic community engagement. We'll hear from Chris and Kathy on Indigenous engagement strategies, 
how to promote authentic engagement and hear about the obstacles that they didn't see coming. Indigenous engagement is a skill and a practice that in my eyes is often undervalued, misunderstood and very difficult to do well. When people talk about this in everyday language, community engagement is used as a catch-all phrase to refer to any form of external engagement from the most tokenistic of approaches through to the highest value of true community partnerships, empowerment and delegation. Adding an Indigenous lens to this community engagement adds another layer of complexity and not enough organisations understand why that's necessary or how to do it well. Research released by Generation One earlier this year, the Indigenous Employment Index, found that only 57% of surveyed employers had an Indigenous pillar in their community engagement strategy. And the impacts of this engagement or lack of were quite clear in our research. Considering just one of the possible outcomes, Indigenous employment, we found that employers who had a specific approach to Indigenous engagement had more than double the Indigenous employment rates of other organisations. So today we hope to build a deeper and common understanding of Indigenous engagement and how it is truly a precursor to any meaningful relationships and outcomes. I look forward to exploring this with you, our audience, and our panellists today. The format for today will see each of our panellists give a brief introductory statement, followed by a facilitated discussion amongst the panel with questions from the audience. So as we go, please do start submitting your questions at any time through the Pigeonhole app, and we will endeavour to answer as many as we can during our short time today. So now I'll hand over to Chris for his opening remarks. Thanks very much, Shelley. Um, and when I first got asked, um, and I am joining everyone today from the Wurundjeri Woi country. I'm actually sitting at the University of Melbourne at the moment um, in a session on Indigenous economic empowerment for Aboriginal Victorians. So uh, I've quickly kind of broken out from that today. But I was just kind of considering the question around authentic community engagement, and and I kind of have to go back to my my personal life. So I, I grew up in an Aboriginal community called Manangreta in Arnhem Land, which is east of Darwin, probably by about uh, 500 k's by road, 550 k's by road, um, and spent 18 years there in total. Later on in my working life, I worked for a company called Jarwin Indigenous Corporate Partnerships in Broome, where we had lots and lots of corporate people who, uh, I'm probably one of those now, would come up to um, the West Kimberley region and would volunteer with Aboriginal organisations or Aboriginal communities and the number one question I always got asked was, how do we engage with the community? Um, and I had a really, really simple answer for that, particularly in remote communities. And the, the simple answer was, if you're driving in a car or you're walking along the road, smile and wave. And it's literally as simple as smiling and waving because a lot of those people won't know um, why you're there. Those community members won't know why you're there or what purpose you were there for. But if you continue to smile and you continue to wave at everybody who goes past, at some point, one of those community members will approach you, introduce themselves and say, hey, how are you going? What are you up to? Why are you here? And then that starts the process of community engagement, because if you're a, a, you know, a person from Sydney or Melbourne who's never really engaged with Aboriginal people before, um, having that soft touch approach around why you're there, explaining that you're working with the local Aboriginal organisation or the local um, Aboriginal Community Council or something along those lines will eventually get people to um, understand why you're there and that you're there in support. Um, now, when you consider how to take that into a corporate environment, I think the intent is pretty much exactly the same. It's about genuine engagement when you're engaging with community. And I can't say that you can smile and wave in somewhere like Melbourne because um, people will think you're a bit weird. But when you're approaching Aboriginal communities, when you're approaching um, Aboriginal businesses, it's about that openness and the willingness to engage genuinely so that um, you can understand or I can understand as a corporate entity what challenges are in place for that community, what challenges are in place for that organisation and is there any way that I can assist? Because in some cases I can't. Um, and some cases what we're trying to do won't actually work. But if you're having that open and honest conversations uh, to say, actually, that's not something that I can assist with. 
um, then most people are pretty open to that and their understanding of that because we can't be all things to all people. So being open, being honest and being genuine, I think is, is the la- is the, you know, the three things that I'd, I'd like to say to people on the call is, is if you're going to do community engagement, be open, honest and genuine. Thanks, Shelley. Thank you, Chris. Thanks very much. Cathy, over to you. Oh, thank you so much, Shelley. And can I just start by acknowledging the traditional owners of where I am and where Mary Beck is, which is the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung Wai people, um, who never ceded sovereignty. And I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And can I also acknowledge all First Peoples that are on, on the uh, panel and the call today? So... This is a story about a council being approached by the traditional owners um, of the land um, and making a request of us. Um, so let me start by explaining what Marybeck Council is, formerly Moreland. Um, we're a city of 175,000 people in the inner north uh, and north of Melbourne, formed back in 1994 when the then state government did mass local council amalgamations across Victoria, uh, and the then Moreland Council was formed from Brunswick Council, Coburg Council and parts of Broadmeadows. This council has long had a history of commitment to Aboriginal reconciliation and walking together with the traditional owners, uh, but a new challenge arose for us late in 2021, which I'm going to very quickly explain today. So in October last year, my office received an email from a community member writing on behalf of the Wurundjeri elders as representatives of the traditional owners. And they were seeking a meeting with me and the mayor on a sensitive and important matter, which they didn't quite reveal what it was. It was described as a confronting example of ingrained racism of historic origin relating to the city that involves ongoing insensitivity. And the, the letter of request for a meeting went on to say, revelation of this hidden in plain sight example will provide the city with an opportunity for truth telling, acknowledgement and healing. So that was pretty intriguing, um, but when the traditional owners seek a meeting, um, of course, the mayor and councillors wanted to say yes to that. And the meeting of the elders and the community members with my mayor and myself and a director took place in late November 2021. At that meeting, four Wurundjeri elders told us very clearly that the name Moreland was racist. And the evidence they presented about that was um, that the name Moreland was chosen back in 1994 it was taken by the state government at the time from Moreland Road and probably Moreland Station. And those things were named after an, an estate um, which a guy called Farquhar McRae had bought uh, in various tranches in the late 1830s. And he had named that estate after a slave estate in Jamaica. Uh, that, that estate was named Moreland of different spellings. Um, and it was a slave estate. It had multiple hundreds of slaves any given year in the 18th century and into the um, early 19th. Uh, and they made money out of slave trading, amongst other things. At the meeting, the four elders spoke very strongly about why it was racist, why it was associated in the late 1830s with the incredibly rapid dispossession of Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people. And they outlined a very clear request to the council, which was to change our name in 2022. It was a pretty scary request in some ways, but the mayor and the council and the organisation responded swiftly. And uh, within about three weeks, at a special meeting of the council decided in principle to proceed with changing the name of council subject, of course, to state government support and community consultation. And a process then took place of co-designing a community engagement process, having already decided that the name would change, but going forward with a process to consult on which name would be the new name. 
a ceremony in which the elders ceremonially presented some options for names, each of them a Woi Warung word, and the names were presented on a paperback scroll, burnt into the paperback scroll at a ceremony held at Coburg Town Hall, which was a really important ceremony and quite beautiful. A, a pretty intense community consultation process that followed uh, where the three Woiwurrung names were put out to community consultation and one name attracted clear majority support. And in July 2022, there was a further significant ceremony held in Glenroy where the name Mary Beck was declared as the preferred new name of council. And the name Mary Beck in Woiwurrung means rocky country, reflecting um, the basalt on which these lands are, are based on but also uh, resonating for our community with the Mary Creek, which is a beautiful creek and area running through our local government area and others. And then only four weeks ago, uh, following support and approval by the state government, this council's name changed to Marybeck City Council. And you can see behind me, I hope you can, um, the new name of the council and the beautiful leaf uh, which is um, designed by Mandy Nicholson, a Wurundjeri artist and all-round amazing person, uh, which she allowed us to use all through the consultation process on the renaming of Moreland, now Marybeck. Now, throughout this process, the Wurundjeri elders were incredibly committed. They were patient, they were generous, they were honest and they were inspiring. And for their part, the Moreland mayor and councillors were brave and dedicated. Um, they were dedicated to listening and acting in response to what the elders asked. And one of the key things that was probably part of the success of this process was after some initial meetings between the mayor, CEO, director and the elders, um, the processes had started happening and um, we proposed that we didn't need to meet as often. And the elders said, no, these regular meetings are incredibly important. And what that meant was, is that really for the last 10 months, the leadership of this council and the elders of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung have met weekly. Um, and that's been both an extraordinary privilege and an incredible and important way of shaping this process and shaping Marybeck Council's response to what was going on. During this process, it wasn't just a consultation process with the community as well. It was also, of course, truth-telling and education. So a couple of things I learnt through this and that we learnt. So I started off thinking that this was all about racism and I went off and um, read a book about the origins of Jamaican slavery and what it meant. And it was about racism and it was incredibly important in terms of where we stand as a council. But importantly, this was also about that intense and awful dispossession that happened over just over a couple of years in the late 1830s and the association of the name Moreland with that dispossession and all the resulting intergenerational uh, disadvantage and terrible things that resulted from that. And then this story is also about the celebration of traditional history of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people and the celebration of contemporary language and culture as well, uh, which was a lovely thing to be part of. A big thing we learned was about listening. So at those weekly meetings, sometimes uh, we immediately got what the elders were saying to us and what the community members were saying to us. Sometimes we didn't. Sometimes the sorts of processes that we usually use as a council aligned well with what the elders were asking of us. And sometimes they didn't. And our usual community consultation processes are a bit of an example of that. We were privileged to benefit from advice from the elders um, of material that might help us. Um, and so for instance, there was episodes of TV series, um, a speech by Neville Bonner, um, and, and a film that was recommended as well. And all of those things helped us uh, come together with the elders, I guess, to walk together on this. We learned as part of that that um, our usual local government processes 
are, um, and uh, this is a learning process for many of us, um, are part of what comes from colonialism. And of course, you can track back a lot of traditional government processes back to the way uh, the British Empire was invading and putting processes in place long ago. And sometimes our processes need to be changed in order to decolonise. And so with the renaming process uh, that we embarked on, for something of that much symbolic importance, we would normally have gone to the community and asked the community, uh, what do you reckon should we rename? In this case, after strong advice from the elders, also reflections on the, uh, I guess, the impact on well-being of the marriage equality referendum, amongst other things, uh, the council decided to decide in principle to just go ahead with renaming and consult only on the new name. So this was a, a process which I think people right across our organisation, staff right across the organisation worked so hard to support meeting the request of the elders. The councillors and mayor worked really hard to respond to the elders' request and took quite a bit of criticism from a vocal minority for doing so. We were so privileged to experience the leadership of the elders um, and it's been overall a fantastic story for us of talking about um, Aboriginal history and Aboriginal contemporary culture with our own staff and with the community. An amazing opportunity. But we have so much work yet to do in becoming a culturally safe organisation, in improving our employment of First Peoples uh, and um, working together with elders and with First Peoples um, right across our municipality on more social justice and uh, better support of our communities. So it's a privilege to share this with you today and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Cathy, and thank you for walking us through in detail. I'm um, not sure if you were watching the Pigeonhole app, but you were answering questions as they came up about the community engagement process. So um, thank you for walking us through sort of the step-by-step in the reality of, of uh, how much is involved in making such a significant change, um, especially when something's been in place for such a long time as well. So thank you. Um, just to help us round out kind of the foundation for today's discussion, I'm wondering, Chris, if I can call on you to share a little bit more about Wilson's experience with Indigenous engagement uh, and particularly the journey that you've been on to understand how community views Wilson and, and what you're doing about that. Yeah, thanks, Shelley. And, you know, I have to pay a lot of kudos to my predecessor, um, a fellow by the name of Jimmy Mai Mai. When Wilson first launched their first rap in 2017, he was the National Indigenous Engagement Manager. He's a Waka Waka man from uh, Queensland region. And he spent a lot of time engaging with our senior leadership team in the security business, particularly around um, some of the discussion points that Kathy he was talking about before, you know, really teaching people about colonialism, the impacts of colonialism, what happened during that period. Um, and then uh, as a result of that, bringing those, the, the senior leaders on a journey um, so that they understood the why that we're actually doing this. Um, you know, in some cases, uh, people would think that security is not a genuinely valued type of role that Aboriginal people can aspire to. If you think about, um, you know, some communities, and I know this, that Aboriginal people are racially profiled as they walk into a shopping centre and they're, they're kind of followed around Coles or Woolworths or some of those other big brands and, and you know, shops like that. So for people to aspire to work in security is, is something that's really quite challenging um, due to, you know, past policies. I think um, the way we've kind of positioned how that works in the future is if I think back to my own experience, as I said, that in, living in remote communities, um, it's often older members of the community, be it men or women, who start up night patrols in those communities. And they, they do that with the express intent to keep their community safe, to make sure their kids are at home on time, uh, getting good night's sleep and, and, and all those types of things. So if I kind of look at the security industry, I, I kind of see it pretty similarly to what and the intent of why those uh, those um, old women and old men started those kind of night patrol uh, type processes. It was really around, um, you know, making sure that the community is safe and everybody is getting on 
so we we embarked on a journey through Jimmy about what what how security relates to Aboriginal communities, and he he spent a long time in, in Queensland in particular talking to traditional owners around um, you know the values of Wilson security, the values of the of, um, that they're trying to instill in terms of the workforce. We're lucky enough that we're a national company and and can provide opportunities from. Um, you know, I think we have a, a subcontract up in Mornington Island in the Gulf of Carpentaria. Um, we have lots of contracts here in Melbourne. Um, we have contracts in Kalgoorlie. So being able to offer opportunities for Aboriginal people as well is is one of the key drivers to, to why we've undertaken this process. And whilst Jimmy was in board, um, you know, they were actually doing a lot of memorandums of understanding uh, with local prescribed body corporates up in Queensland. And um, this is how seriously and, and how embedded that, that Jimmy had, had actually got the senior leadership team. We were actually approached by the Adani coal mine to provide security services there. Um, and a bit like, I suppose, Kathy's example, we were approached by the traditional owners who, had, who knew that we had been approached. And they said, and they spoke to us about our memorandum of understanding um, and, you know, what we were trying to achieve in that MOU and how the Adani coal mine conflicted with that kind of viewpoint. Um, and so Wilson actually withdrew from that process just based on the fact that we had an, an existing MOU with that prescribed body corporate and it was kind of against the values of, of, of our genuine partnership that we were talking about. So um, I thought it was really quite interesting that, you know, a corporate entity put um, community before profit in that instance, I suppose. As we've been moving on um, on our journey, uh, you know, you'll, you'll kind of notice my shirt here. I can't remember which one. This is our wrap artwork, uh, which is done by Hazel Calburn. Um, but we were wearing this kind of shirt in lots of different remote communities. Again, Hazel is a, is a far north Queensland uh, woman. And there was some feedback from other communities that, that, that this artwork didn't necessarily represent where um, the artwork that we were wearing it. So um, in various places, we're, we're still undertaking the journey, but in Darwin, for example, we um, worked with a Larrakia artist to design a uniform that is very, very similar to this, but with Larrakia artwork on it. Uh, we've undertaken the same journey in uh, Alice Springs, where we engaged with Tungajira artists. Uh, and to purchase some artwork from there. Here in Melbourne, we've worked with a Victorian Indigenous artist as well um, to, to do that, to do a similar thing. And this is really about how can we um, not so much prove to people, but work with Aboriginal communities to say that we are on the same page as you and we will listen. So um, whilst we don't have uh, uniforms all throughout the country, um, we're kind of slowly getting to the point where um, where we can, we will endeavour to have local artwork on, on shirts like this to kind of downplay, I suppose, the security aspect and, and really talk more about the customer engagement aspect of, of what we do. That's probably the easiest place to finish off there, Shelley. Yeah, thanks Thanks so much, Chris. I'm getting uh, some really great questions coming through the Pigeonhole app and there's one particular theme I think we're ready to jump into now, which, uh, which is a question about... Uh, the direction of engagement and particularly around timeframes. So I, I do want to ask you both and the examples that you've shared have been a combination of um, traditional owners particularly approaching you and saying we would like you to do something um, for us and, and for the country as well. Um, and then Chris, you've also spoken to the, the sort of the outreach from the perspective of the non-Indigenous organisation reaching out to Indigenous communities. And I just want to tease that out a little bit. Um, one of the questions here is um, what's important to keep in mind uh, and how do you involve Indigenous communities who have historically been over-researched and over-engaged? How do you balance how do you balance that knowing they have so many competing priorities and, and so many reasons to engage with so many organisations? Um, how do you go about that? And, and Cathy, I might throw to you first. Thanks so much, Shelley, and, and really lovely to hear, Chris, about uh, what Wilson is doing. Um, so I, I think a, a couple of things in response to the question. The first is go where the energy is, I think, and um, lots of well-meaning organisations and government agencies, I think, want to consult with traditional owners and with First Peoples on lots of different topics. And, and I think if you've got a way to discern what are the topics are uh, important to um, First Peoples, then that's going to be really important. We, we have a First Nations Advisory Committee, which includes 
um, representatives of, uh, it doesn't include traditional owner representatives, but also other First Peoples who, who live or work in Marybeck. Um, and that provides a really good basis for us of communicating with um, First Peoples that are in Marybeck. But I also think, yeah, it does come down to listening. So much of this is about listening, I think. And I, mean, I can remember other consultations I've done where something which the council thought was incredibly important, and I'm thinking of a different different council from the one I'm not, uh, currently at, and we sat down with a bunch of elders and, and other First Peoples and it just wasn't really that important to them. Um, and I, I think you need to listen to that and if you're really committed to uh, reconciliation and really committed to taking action that matters is to work out what does matter then um, because coming in as a government agency or another organisation and saying, well, this really matters to us, it's very important to us that you tell us what you think about this thing that matters to us, that doesn't work, I don't think. Um, so, yeah, that would that would be one suggestion. Mm -hmm. And what you're saying there is be be guided by Indigenous people on what is what is important to them. Um, Chris, any perspectives to share? Yeah, I mean, we've got a really great um, partnership with a, an Aboriginal-owned and controlled security company in Perth called Eon Protection, run by uh, a Noongar man uh, by the name of Jerry Matera. And um, one of the things that we've really learned out of, out of working with Jerry is this idea that um, Aboriginal communities know what they want to achieve and know what they want to do. And so we've we've been working together on a few kind of projects out in, in more regional areas um, with some resources companies. And, and we were kind of talking about the fact that, um, you know, there's employment opportunities on the contract that we can actually offer to people. But outside of that contract, there are other um, community engagement type principles that we can, um, not so much principles, but community engagement activities that we can be doing which will benefit the community in that in that way so we've done a fair bit of work around um, this idea of not so much night patrols but partnering with some of the trusts that are out there and how can Wilson then um, look at seconding I suppose some of our skill sets into some of those communities um, uh, into doing some of the work that they might need to do that they want to progress themselves um, utilising some of those trusts to and, and the contract to be able to work with the resources companies to say, well, here's an opportunity that the community has identified. Wilson is quite happy to work with that resources company to see what we can do. Um, and, you know, the example is it's not a night patrol, but they were talking about a kind of a community engagement type person who would just kind of cruise around the community um, later on at night to make sure that kids are... Um, you know, okay, and the home life and that kind of stuff and start referring through people through the services, um, working with the youth programs and that kind of stuff out there. So that was a learning that Wilson took on through our partnership with Jerry and it's probably something that um, the business would not have identified previously. You know, we were pretty black and white about this is what Wilson does. We do this kind of uh, process. We can install security cameras for you. We can provide... Um, manned security officers to, to look at your sites. But those extra, um, the peripherals around those, those com the community life and, and what that involves um, prior to, you know, three to four years ago, we probably would have never been going close to that. Um, so as Cathy said, that, that real listening to your partners that you have in place um, is, is a key part to kind of respectful community engagement. And then I think in some cases, a lot of corporate organisations partner with communities to say, if I give you this, i.e. some uh, a job or some money, I want to get something out of that. So I want you to find people to be employed with me or I want you to help me find Aboriginal businesses to work in our supply chain. Whereas a lot of the, some of the, in the last probably three years particularly, um, to dispel the uh, perception of what security does in communities and what it is, um, we've been entering into partnerships with organisations that have no relevance to us and we're not, we're not seeking any kind of benefit from. So in Alice Springs, we partner with the Arundel Community Boxing Association. Um, ostensibly, they're a boxing club. Uh, they've won a heap of gold medals at the recent Australian titles. 
but they also do fitness and wellbeing classes for women and children when they're not being a boxing club. And they, per week, I think they have 500 women and children um, attending their classes. So for us, there was no gain out, out of that outside of supporting the community, knowing that that community had a, had an issue around health and wellbeing in that community. And, you know, we kind of went in there with that intent. We're just supporting the health and wellbeing of the community. So um, I think that's another kind of learning that I've taken out of this is that you just, you know, sometimes you do partnerships without without looking for anything in return. Mm. I would, I would certainly agree with that. And I think for our audience online, speaking from an Indigenous perspective, um, people can spot that coming a mile away <laughs> when, mm. when you know, in the spirit of partnership, but actually it's quite a transactional relationship. But I think yeah, lots of us have, have been there, done that and seen it well and truly before. So understanding that that, that may be how um, reach outs are um, are perceived is, I think, quite important. Um, and if I might just add my own perspective to this particular question, I think it's such a good one around when when mob are over engaged and over researched, and I think it speaks a little bit to um, the the expectation that might come from non Indigenous organisations saying we're doing you a favour by engaging with you on something that's important to us, um, and just expecting that people will make time um, and that they will give their best advice, and um, certainly that can have that you know, it can happen and many people are very, very happy to to support, you know, good good intent and, um, you know, great outcomes that are being pushed. But um, for, for my side, I would say valuing the, the time and the advice that you get from, from Indigenous people, whether it's actually paying people on an advisory council, for example, paying for specific um, cultural advice or cultural engagement. Um, there, there are ways to to value that, but certainly the, the main message that I'm taking from both you, Cathy and Chris, is really around understanding that your priorities as an organisation may not be uh, as important and, and shouldn't be considered as important, certainly not more important than the priorities of the community that you're engaging with as well. Um, the next tricky topic that I'm keen to delve into, and it's again come through the questions, um, is around the the symbolism, I guess, of Indigenous engagement and how you might have really great artwork on, on uniforms or in or in um, in your offices. Um, or, Kathy, you've made a, a name change, which you know, is, is still highly significant and certainly is, um, I don't want to take away from the amount of work and the self-reflection that has to go into a process like that. Um, but how do you also um, have to marry that with changes in the way that you operate, the way that you engage uh, and the way that you do business? Um, Chris, I might hand to you first on this one. Yeah, thanks for giving me the tricky one uh, first up. <laughs> um, look, I think um, when it comes to things like your, if you're tendering on government contracts and, and, and your reconciliation action plan, there's always the outcome that you're supposed to achieve, which is, you know, employment parity or a certain amount of money that you're spending with organisations. Um, and... I think to a certain extent that drives change, but it's not the once you've got those kind of targets or commitments in place, um, the driving of the change then really comes back to the relationships and the and if I'm if I'm using the analogy of the reconciliation action plans, um, you know your respect and your relationships that you're developing with communities, and so when you're talking about symbolism, it's really hard to. Um, like you, you need to be able to change the structure within your organisation to actually affect the change that you're trying to do to make it not symbolic. Um, so in the employment realm, for example, you do have to actually change the way corporate entities recruit people because there is different ways that, um, you know, communities want to engage with you. But by the same token, you know, our recruitment organisations are very process-driven, they're very automatic-driven, um, and you have to be able to just, and, and they just want a transactional relationship. Whereas one of the um, initiatives we've been able to start up here is um, having two Aboriginal mentors that are on staff within Wilson. Um, and every time an Aboriginal person in, uh, goes to apply with us, they are contacted by one of those mentors prior to even an interview process, prior to any 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 other contact within the business really outside of you know, the web link that you go to apply. Um, and then those Indigenous mentors really kind of ask the question of those applicants around how they are, are they set up for the interview process? Do they need a hand with the interviewing process? 
Um, you know, do they understand what Wilson does from a reconciliation perspective and a community engagement perspective? Um, and do they understand the kind of role that they're going into? So they, they really put a lot of work into that process prior to. Um, and I think that's the structural change that we're kind of talking about, to, to go away from that transactional nature of, um, you know, this is... We're, we're employing Aboriginal people because we need to employ Aboriginal people because we have a target. That's not, that's that's a bit different, I think. It's more around how can we actually support Aboriginal people who understand what Wilson does, why we do what we do, and um, making sure that they actually want to work for our company. Uh, because some people may hear that story and say, well, no, that's not for me. Um, you know, and I think it's, it's a bit the same when it gets to the, um, the kind of community engagement piece I'll have, you know, multiple conversations per week, per month, per year. That will never result in anything outside of a conversation with Aboriginal people and developing a relationship. Um, again, it's not necessarily symbolism. It's about trying to find common ground. And maybe one of those conversations will lead to, lead to some kind of business or um, other relationship two or three years down the track. Um, you know, so, yeah, it's a long-winded response to a very hard question. Yes, yeah, so we're trying to hit you with all the hard questions today. So <laughs> thank you, Chris, for taking that. Uh, Cathy, I'll hand over to you. Uh, thanks, Shelley. Um, so look, obviously, of course, um, uh, pragmatic and practical steps on the ground are incredibly important to justice for Aboriginal people. And in Victoria and potentially nationally, um, you know, we're looking ahead to treaty um, and in Victoria, you know, there will be, there is a, a state treaty framework that's just been put in place, which will lead to negotiations over very practical things as part of treaty, both at state level and I, I think at a local level as well. Um, at our council, we're doing a bunch of stuff and we have a long way to go. There'll be um, areas and, and departments and uh, businesses on this call who have done a lot more in lots of spaces than we have. Um, one of some of the good practical things that we do is around procurement. So the State Government of Victoria has an Indigenous procurement panel of, of Indigenous-run businesses across a whole range of, um, of uh, services and products, and we put in place in our procurement policy incentives to use suppliers from that panel. So that will help us increase the percentage of our purchasing power that goes towards Indigenous-controlled organisations. Um, we've... We're in the last throes of developing an Aboriginal employment strategy, which will have targets in it about um, improving the number of Indigenous people that we have working for us, which we absolutely have to do. Uh, plus, we have a whole heap of community projects that stem from our long-term statement of commitment agreed with traditional owners and other First Nations people. So things like developing in the long term a, a community hub, an Indigenous community hub, um, at the Bullet Maroop site in, in Glenroy and, and other, other projects as well. But I think all of that has to be underpinned by cultural safety and, um, and there's a lot that goes into cultural safety, but some of it is absolutely symbolism. And I can remember at one of the ceremonies that was held, an Aboriginal staff member who works for now Mary Beck came up to me and said, this is creating a culturally safe organisation. This is what it looks like. And yeah, we do have a long way to go, but uh, it, it's important. It's really important. Yeah, thank, thank you both. And thank you both also for um, explaining that the symbolism, you know, on its own can go uh, you know, some way, but it's it really the process of engagement and the process of truth-telling is really a self-reflective process. And, and where you get the real value out of this engagement is in understanding what this means for you and your organisation, the things that you have to change, um, the ways that you can you know, transform your own workplace and your own processes to your examples, Chris, around recruitment um, and really understanding this is not um, sort of a, a one-way flow of information or engagement. It really has to be both parties side by side for it to be really meaningful. Um, the next question that I want to go to is getting more into the specifics of how do you do Indigenous engagement well? Um, we have a few, a couple of questions coming through here saying, um, can you do it via email and phone? Do you have to go out on country? Do you need to meet people face to face? Um, for those who might be, I guess, earlier on the Indigenous engagement journey, where do you start? Chris, I might hand to you first. Um, 
you know, I think through the COVID um, period, one of the best advents has been Microsoft Teams and being able to do video conferencing. Um, but if you want to do Indigenous engagement, that's probably not the way to do it, uh, if I'm being really honest. Um, you know, if, having been able to... So from my perspective, Aboriginal people are masters of body language. They are masters of understanding tonation, understanding um, what you're trying to say and all the nonverbal cues that are going with that. And the only way to really prove how genuine you are in your engagement is to actually do that face-to-face. -face. Um, now, you know, a lot of corporate entities don't want to hear that because teams have saved them a lot of money flying people around the countryside. But, you know, if I was going to actually meet with an Aboriginal business or an Aboriginal community to develop a partnership or an MOU, my first meeting, probably half a dozen, dozen meetings, would be face-to-face. -face. Um, and then once you've established relationships properly then you can kind of move into the more virtual environment or, or telephones and those types of things but you know that old adage that I, I mentioned before about just waving and smiling in communities until people can see you and eyeball you and see your non-verbal cues um, they're not really going to be able to ever trust you for one of a better um, description I suppose so for me it's got to be face to face um, and and probably more often than not it's face to face um, yeah, that's probably the easiest way to say it. <laughs> thanks, Chris. Cathy? Um, yeah, thanks for that question. And it's, uh, I think this is, um, it's a pretty hard question, I think, and, and I totally agree that face-to-face -face is important. Um, that said, being able to meet with really, really busy people on, on Zoom can be incredibly helpful, and, and Aboriginal elders are often very, very busy people. Um, and I, I think, you know, at my council is an urban council and a lot of um, the First Nations people in Marybeck are very technologically aware. We were not able to do targeted First Nations engagement on our renaming process beyond the work with elders, but our broader community engagement did see um, First Nations people, of course, responding as part of that. And there was lots of responses online and in hard, hard copy mail outs as well. So in a broad community engagement, that's not the ideal way to do it, but we still did get some incredibly meaningful feedback of what it meant to people as Aboriginal people that this process was happening. Um, we would try and work obviously with First Nations people to create space for engagement and our First Nations advisory committee is important there. Councils that are really evolved in this space will have, um, you know, First Nations policy workers as well, and that might be something we aspire to in Mary Beck, but we haven't got that yet. Um, we'll have First Nations policy workers who, who can directly reach out to community and hold events or, um, you know, use whatever technology works best, WhatsApp or, um, or Zoom or in-person events that, that will draw people in on the things that matter. So we've got a journey to go there but at the moment we rely quite a lot on um, the really great group of people that we've got uh, which includes elders from Wurundjeri and elsewhere and other First Nations people on our committee advisory committee. Yeah. I, I think you both raised some really critical points there which which includes a, where you both started you, you didn't call this out but I want to make sure um, that it is it is noted that you you both have started in your traditional on traditional lands. So you haven't, you've, you've really done a, a process to, to map out who are the critical um, stakeholders for you, which in, in both of your um, examples have been traditional owners. And, and Cathy, it's quite um, clear as to what that remit is for you. But Chris, you know, with a national footprint, mm -hmm. that's a lot of different groups that you're um, yeah. engaging with. Did you want to add any comment to that, Chris? Uh, look, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty lucky as I've got some pretty established relationships nationally that I can also lean on to get introductions to people that I would that I would not necessarily know so I think that's another way to start community engagement if um, our our it's not really an industry but the work that we do is is quite small um, and if you don't know someone well then I'm sure the six degrees of separation will enable you to be introduced to that certain person so I think leveraging on some relationships um, that you have existing or those types of things 
um, to get introduced to someone in far north Queensland, the traditional owner group, or down here, you might, you know, we might be wanting to do some work with the Gunai Kurnai mobs. And so, you know, I've, I've leaned on some relationships to be able to get introductions to those people to start developing our own relationships. So, yeah, nationally, it, it does get quite hard because um, you are only one person or one team, and, and you know, it, it can make it difficult to develop um, meaningful relationships that. Um, aren't transactional, I suppose you could say. When you're only seeing everyone once every two years, it gets a bit difficult. But um, through, those, as I said, those other relationships, that you, you can get introductions to the people that you need to. Mm. And I would definitely add to that too, that Indigenous people uh, are, are very highly organised people in terms of how we organise ourselves as groups. And um, you may be surprised. I think the, the critical place to start is on your own country and, and where you're working and living and, and playing. Um, that will give you some guidance for sure. Um, and then often you will find that there is, a, a for example, a land council um, for those lands who may be able to point you in the right directions. Or um, often there are, you know, for, for example, here at Noongar Country, we have countless um, advisory groups to different kinds of organisations um, and how we organise ourselves with the, with the pending um, Noongar settlement, it really sets up specific corporations specific to particular uh, Noongar country. Um, and then we actually elect um, particular uh, directors and representatives of our people. So often if you don't have your own personal relationships to leverage, there are often organised groups that you can tap into. Um, and I just wanted to add one more thing to that, to this conversation around uh, the, the whole it depends situation on how best to engage Indigenous people. Um, sometimes you can get away with with emails and phone calls if it's, a, if it's on a small matter of relatively, you know, it, it's relatively straightforward. Um, but I would draw the example of um, the, the Uluru statement. That was a process of some quite widespread Indigenous uh, community consultation and it culminated in 250 Indigenous leaders flying into Uluru to go to what, you know, what we call the heart of our country um, to really spend time on country, be welcomed, have ceremony and discuss an issue that is of critical importance to the country. So um, that's just one example of, of how things that are highly significant probably should be treated um, as opposed to if you're getting a, a quick sign-off, for example, on some wording for your acknowledgement. It may not require a, a whole meeting of elders. So, again, it's no straightforward answer in this sense, but um, certainly I think you you learn as you go and that it's so much guidance to be to be given as well. Now, we are running out of time, so I, I think we've got time for one last question and then I think we'll need to, to wrap it up. Um, and the final question I want to ask is around how you influence those naysayers. When you're at a particular part on your journey, whether it's you know, as an individual or as an organisation, and those around you aren't on the same page, and you think this is a really important thing to do, uh, how have you influenced others to, to understand the importance of this? And Cathy, I might go to you first. Oh, thanks, Shelley. And look, it's um, it's a really hard thing because the, um, for instance, the process that I've been talking about, the naysayers you know, ranged from genuine questions about how much money is it going to cost and concerns to pretty racist um, and overt racist comments as well, which was um, hurtful for everyone involved in, in the process, I think. Um, I think education and truth-telling is important. And, you know, there was just, there was one session, uh, we had an education session and one of the amazing elders came and it wasn't well attended. There was like four community members there of whom two were very negative about the name change. And this amazing elder just sat and talked through with them what it meant to be saddled with a name that was associated with slavery, to be saddled with a name that was associated with dispossession and genocide. And it, I'm not sure it worked, but I reckon it made a difference. And that was a pretty amazing opportunity for that community member sitting down with an elder. I think you can put all the arguments out there that you want. There's a portion that are probably quite anti-government and anti-reconciliation and sort of the anti-state government and anti-vaxxer campaigning that's happened in Victoria probably was turned towards our topic a little bit as well. But I think all you can do is be authentic in this space. And I many times just talked about that I do not want to be an employer associated with a racist name and I do not want to be an employer associated with a name that commemorates dispossession and I'm not willing to do that and that that was important in drawing a line in the sand I guess 
but we also had to accept that we wouldn't convince everyone. Thanks, but they might over time, I think, like, like things are changing rapidly in this space. Like three years ago, nobody, um, hardly any non-Indigenous people knew the name NAM and now it is used all the time for Melbourne, which is mm-hmm. delightful to see. Absolutely. I think it's very much a, a meeting the moment time, yeah. time as well. Thank you, Cathy. Chris? Yeah, thanks, Shelley. And I, I agree with Cathy wholeheartedly. It, it just really is about education. And, and unfortunately, if you're of kind of my vintage, um, you know, I didn't learn anything about Australia's history um, prior to colonialism or colonisation um, in school at all. You know, I was lucky enough to grow up in an Aboriginal community. I was told lots of stories. I, I'm privileged enough to know people that are first contact uh, as well. So, you know, no, knowing people that, are, you know, the first time they saw a non-Aboriginal person was a, actually a Japanese fighter plane that had been down um, near the community. So, you know, there's there's a whole... And I think most people are generally and genuinely empathetic people overall. And once people start to understand what has happened in this country and the history um, of this country that isn't necessarily told in our education systems or or post that, um, I find that most people become genuinely uh, supporters or allies of reconciliation and they understand a bit more why we're doing this. to Cathy's point, we're probably never going to change everyone's minds and that's that's okay. But you can also kind of relate, um, you know, and I use the term equity a lot as opposed to equality because there's always that argument about, well, I treat everybody equally, um, you know, and, and it just shouldn't be a problem for me. But then, you know, I kind of relate sometimes and this, you know, this is just an example that I use every now and again about, well, if a person's in a wheelchair, you wouldn't be able to expect them to get up a set of stairs without a hand. You know what I mean? So, um, you know, some in some parts of the country, there isn't generational wealth or generational employment or or generational business ownership that Aboriginal people have had. So there needs to be um, an understanding that sometimes people need a hand up. They don't not, not necessarily asking for a hand out, but it's just a hand up to be able to achieve what you know most Australians have had, which is two to three generations of employment, business ownership, and or wealth uh, behind them home ownership, for example. So, you know, I, I think most people understand that it's it generally the message gets through and that they become allies. Yeah, thank you so much both. And I, I think, Cathy and Chris, you're both personal examples as well of, of people who have, you know, gone through an education system, me included, who never learnt about uh, colonisation of this country. Um, and to hear you both using words like that, the colonisation and trying to decolonise practices, like they're words that can make people feel very, very uncomfortable if it's the first time that you hear them and it's in this kind of context about having to change the way that you do things and you do business in the way that you operate. So um, I think the, the educate, I just wanted to call out sort of the, the process that you clearly have both been on as individuals to get you to this point as well I think it's a really great example for others to follow. So I'm so conscious of time and I'm so sorry that we can't have this conversation all day but we will have to close the conversation there. Um, Chris Davies and Kathy Henderson thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your insights and expertise. Uh, To our audience, please take a minute before you log off Pigeonhole to provide your feedback and to rate today's discussion. And to the audience, I would like to thank you for your time and participation and your wonderful quality questions coming through the app. Uh, I'd like to remind you all that this discussion has been recorded and will soon be available via your live stream link and on the CEDA website next week if you would like to share with your colleagues and your network. Please feel free to continue today's conversation by connecting with CEDA via LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube or Facebook or all of them. Uh, Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your day.